unmute. There you go. I there apologize, go. Glenn. I had noon on my calendar, and I was sitting out on my patio, being quiet, serene, and I got that. <laughs> anyway, you've never seen anybody get off of one uh, close and onto another close as fast as I just did. So my name is Nancy Burkhalter, and I am an alcoholic. Because of a loving God and the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, people just like you. I've been sober since November the 7th, 1981. And uh, apparently um, Texans can't tell time. So I just want you to know that right off the bat. So anyway, um, I can't thank you enough for the privilege of being here this morning. Um, I, um, When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, the only thing I was grateful for um, that I thought might be an honor is when I was getting some kind of award or certainly some kind of attention. And I'm grateful I stuck around long enough to absolutely embrace the privilege it is to share and to give back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't have enough time on top of this um, on earth uh, to give back what AA has given me. I grew up in alcoholism and I know that's not unusual. And God puts this part of my story on my heart every time I get the privilege to to share, and that's that I know I'm not the only one in the room that grew up in alcoholism, but um, the uh, chaos, the confusion, the frustration, um, all the things that we know alcoholism, uh, all alcoholism to be was exactly what I felt like completely consumed my family and consum- certainly consumed me. It looked like this. My dad called himself an alcoholic. He just didn't seek out, uh, recovery. And it looked like that every, it seemed like every day he went to work. He he always went to work, whether he should have based on uh, the night before. He always went to work and he made a good day's pay and he took care of us physically. But he believed with all his heart that he could then leave work and stop by what we call in Texas, the local or the beer joint have a couple of beers with his friends. Then he was going to come home and be with his family. And uh, that never happened. That never happened. What he didn't know as an alcoholic is that, as it says in our literature, the phenomenon of craving was going to happen. Not sometimes, not maybe. It was going to happen. And that did happen to him one day at a time over and over and over again. My mother was not an Al-Anon or a pre-Al-Anon. She was an alligator. (laughs) You know, they're snappy and they got big eyes and they can track you down. Well, that's exactly the behavior that my mother demonstrated. Because when my daddy wasn't home exactly when he was supposed to, it just didn't get her down. She went to the phone. She started calling all the bars. She had asked if he was there, and, of course, the bartender knew exactly what to say. He'd say, oh, no, 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 he's not here. He's not here. And so, um, but that doesn't get an alligator down. She said, she would say, get in the car. Get in the car. And that meant that uh, the kids were going to, we were going to get in the car, and we are going to track that boy down. And uh, it wasn't really hard. There was only about three, maybe maybe five beer joints in the small town where I lived. And it really wasn't hard because he used to park out by the dumpster where I thought he, I think he thought his truck became invisible because he wasn't any more creative than that. It seems like he was always parked in the same spot. And then you send the kids in. And, you know, I know the story in many ways can appear humorous. However, I don't want to go in that smoky bar. I don't want to beg my daddy to come home. And it seemed like every day. But alcoholism doesn't leave anybody out. And it it affects the kids. It affects the spouses. It affects affects the neighbors. It affects the employees, the employers. It doesn't leave anybody out. And again, what seemingly was every single day, that chaos and that fight was on as a result of my dad's thinking. I learned something from that. My mother taught me that drinking is bad. People who drink are very bad, and they must be punished. My dad thought that he could drink with impunity. My mother believed that she had the solution to alcoholism, and that's if you punish them enough, and if you punish them right, for some reason they're going to wake up some morning and go, you know, agree. I should not drink. I should come home from work. I should participate in in my family. 
And so that's what I took away from growing up in alcoholism. So, of course, I discovered when I was about 11 years old that I was superior, you know, intellectually superior. Now, you know, that was going on between my two ears. I needed to believe that. I needed to believe I was smarter than anyone else. And if you're an alcoholic of my time, you know what I just said, actually. I'm not enough. I'll never be enough. If I was enough, my family wouldn't like look the way they do. My dad would come home. We wouldn't have to live in the chaos of alcoholism. But I developed early on this arrogance that was palpable. I just did whatever it took to look good and to build on that need to look good. And um, as though I had more money than I had, as, more, as though I was smarter than I was, whatever. And I knew for sure that I would never drink because I'm brilliant. I am too smart to do the things that my loser, uneducated, on and on. Uh, my, my friends, I, I wouldn't, I always say it this way. I wouldn't dishonor this meeting to say the things that I used to say about and to my dad. I was as disrespectful as a human being could be to another human being. And I believed at that time that if I could hurt them, my mom and dad, as much as I hurt, I would feel better. So of course I'm not gonna drink, I'm not stupid. I am educated, I went to college, of course I went to college. You know, I uh, and I'm going to be an educator. I'm going to be rich and famous. And by the way, if you decide you want to be rich and famous, don't become an educator. There's quite a glitch in that plan. <laughs> okay, I've been an educator my entire uh, adult life, and trust me, I'm not rich or famous. So, but you know, I've got to think things like that. I I'm sure that before I worked, I walked into my first job, I said things like. I'm going to change the course of education in America. And again, you know what I just said. I'm not enough. What if I go in there and they find out there's something I don't know? If I was, if I knew everything I needed to know, if I, uh, if I was all the things that I believed and acted as if I was, I would be okay. Got to look good, and I've got to look like I know more than I know. And so I did go to that first job, and I did well. I actually, uh, I got up teaching awards. I, you know, but let me just tell you, it's not hard to get teaching awards if you um, do your job, and Glenn's job, and Carla's job, and Phil's job. It, you know, I thought I was being kind. No, my arrogance. Like I said, walked in a room before I did. I knew better. I had to look like I knew better. I didn't know how to be a friend among the friends. I didn't know how to be a worker among workers. And so I took it over every situation and with a clear conscience. I really believed that I was doing the right thing. So I hope that I'm giving a picture, a clear picture of what the influences that I had. Uh, growing up and what I came to believe were true and then how I took those things from the earliest moment that I thought I was leaving alcoholism what I mean by that I thought you know when I go to college when I move from here to there to there which I did thinking I was getting a better job in 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 the teaching field um I I absolutely believed that I had left alcoholism. I didn't know that when I moved and the influence of alcoholism came with me. You may have heard the expression, when I learned, learned, when I moved and got there, I was there. I was there. And I didn't have any tools whatsoever to not be selfish, self-centered. I had no tools to act better than I felt none. I had not learned those tools and did not know that someday, someday I would need them and someday I would find them. But I did. I did take that drink. When I was in college, I must add, I punished people who drank. Remember, I learned that. If you punish them right, 
punish them enough, you could keep people from becoming those pathetic losers that my dad was because I believed that. And so I punish people. So now when I fast forward, because I haven't taken a drink, fast forward, I moved to Houston, Texas. I'm living in singles apartments. I'm driving a new car. I've got this great job. And I've never been probably more lonely in my life. But one Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, a knock came on my door. And believe it or not, it was some of those same people that I'd actually punished when I was in college because I wanted to save them. They wanted to drink. They wanted to party. And they thought that that was okay. I don't even know if they were alcoholic. But I punished them thinking with a clear conscience that I was saving them. But they came knocking on my door and uh, they wanted to party. And I was like, you know, they didn't expect me to agree. I said, they, they pointed out that these singles apartments, um, I'm going to, there's parties all the time, um, but you need an apartment number. What I know now is that's all they want. They never expected me to say, let's party ever. Because all I had done was punish because I believed that drinking was bad. But in that one second's time, in my loneliness, in my arrogance, in an ego that was beyond description, in that one second's time, I said, hey, let's party. And it's so significant to my story because I am an alcoholic and personal story that believes I better be going to meetings, sponsoring others, have a sponsor, studying the literature, literature praying on my knees being of service to others, I better be doing all the tools, all of the tools, because what if in one second's time, um, yeah, I, ha I have a lot of sobriety, but I know people who after 40 years took the first drink, and I don't want to ever, I don't ever want to leave the no matter what club, ever, and so now I've taken, I've taken a drink, in my opinion, I fed an alcoholic alcohol, I'd competed with alcohol in some way my entire life. And, uh, but I'm not going to drink like my dad. Are you kidding me? How pathetic. How pathetic. And I did. I went to the party and I took a drink and I took a drink and I took a drink and it, nothing seemed to happen. In fact, I think it became, I don't know, nine, 10 o'clock. And I, I said, you know, guys, I got to go. I got to go. I, I got to go to work tomorrow. So I remember, I, you know, I don't remember, but I walked up my own uh, stairs to my apartment that night. I took off my own clothes that night. And I can remember looking in a mirror and saying, it's not drinking. Drinking is not the problem. I, I feel better now that I've had a drink. I'm not as tense now that I have a drink. I didn't feel I didn't care about punishing those people because I had a drink. It's not drinking that's bad. It's that my daddy was pathetic. He wasn't very smart. He was uneducated. He certainly wasn't as sophisticated as me. So that's the problem. And I began to drink. Now, there was moments in time um, where I drank, maybe respectfully, maybe appropriately because I didn't I didn't do all the things that I watched my dad drink and drive uh and I did I, I, I said things to him about that and how pathetic and what a loser he was for doing that because uh, Henry, how could anybody make that decision how could anybody need to have you know this by the by the table in the morning take that drink so that they can go to work how could anybody do that? But I want you to know that I can't, I had principles. I had morals. This is the best way I like to describe it. And unlike my dad, I had these, these principles uh, in my life. And I didn't break one of them right up until I did. And I didn't see that line coming. Because I couldn't see that line coming. I was too busy concentrating and working on my persona. I'm too busy looking good. I'm too busy looking at how much you drink and noticing how 
what a loser you are because you drink like my dad. It can't happen. And I think there is a difference. Some of you came in and you surrendered. You were ready. You said, I need help. You recognized what was happening. I was clueless. To say that I knew I was in trouble would be giving me much too much credit that I don't deserve. Because I I knew that I could never be that. And yet I'm beginning to have that incomprehensible behavior in the demoralization. I'm having that, and I'm the last to know. It took someone else who, after one of my last drunks, I'm going to tell you about that one. I'm not going to go into a, a long drunk log. Just know that I compromise myself in every way that you can, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and mentally. But my last drunk, I had been to a bar two weeks before this dinner party I was going to have, and I I discovered something at the bar this particular night, and that's that when I've had quite a bit to drink, I've become quite the dancer. I mean, like, I'm really good in my own mind. And so I'm out on the dance floor dancing by myself, and... um, and thinking I'm quite good, and the music stops. And for some reason, this bodybuilding team that had just won a big competition were, were going to perform, right? Instead of watching me dance, I was quite insulted. But this bodybuilding group, people did their thing, right? Well, two weeks later, I'm in my own home, and I'd invited people to my home for a dinner party. Not a Super Bowl party, not a beer bust, but a dinner party. And I was nervous about that day. I was like, ah, what if nobody comes to this party? Um, I was living in this beautiful home. Uh, there's a Mercedes 450 SL convertible in the in the garage. There's a custom van in the driveway to pull the boat uh, on the weekends, um, on and on and on. Now, I didn't own any of this. I just lived there, right? But I was really good at looking like I, like I own these things. So I'm just a wreck. So about 1030 in the morning, I began to get really smooth. I, I love the I like the word smooth better than drunk. Drunk seems so harsh, harsh. So anyway, that was the word I chose to use. Can you please? But anyway, so I started getting smooth at about 1030 in the morning. Apparently at 230, I didn't care who came to this stupid party. You know, we had all the booze you could possibly have. We had food catered in. I didn't care. Believe me, emphasis on I didn't care, because let me tell you, apparently people came. Apparently, we did have dinner. But then apparently, we went out on the back patio on this beautiful landscape yard where there is a hot tub, okay? Apparently, when you've been getting smooth all day, it's not good to get in a hot tub. But I decided to do that. And apparently the same song came over the, the, the music that we had piped in that the bodybuilders had used two weeks ago to do their routine. And I became a bodybuilder. I didn't become a bodybuilder in the hot tub. Oh, no. Thank God there weren't the camera uh, on phones on cameras. I jumped out on the on the deck naked, as we say in Texas, and I began to bodybuild, okay? Don't ask me to do it. I hadn't been a bodybuilder since 1981. But the truth is, I did that. It's kind of funny. I can laugh at that today because I've been with you, because I've been with you to look back at that past where I didn't care about anybody else. I thought I was something else. I didn't care about anybody else. And apparently people left. Apparently people, I, I humiliated myself. I had not, I did, it, but here was my response. I had to be told the next day, remember, I'm clueless that somebody like me could be in trouble. But I got to tell you, I had to be told the next day that I had done that. And that I had embarrassed myself and I had embarrassed others. And I didn't care. Really, when you when you get a summary of where I at who I'd become is 
I don't care about anybody else. Yes, I had liquor in my desk drawer when I was teaching children. Yes, 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 I said yes when I meant no. All of them. I broke all of my principles and my morals. And I was the last to know. And somebody got in my face when, in a place I could have lost my job. I was outside the uh, building where I was trying to convince somebody we should live together forever. And they had forgotten and left me. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs to tell them that one last thing. And if that person that 12-stepped me had not put me in my car and taken me to my house, I probably could have let, lost my job and my profession. That was the Eskimo. That was the angel that God put there on, to, to help somebody who was clueless that they were in trouble. And I was told that there's a solution to alcoholism. And it was Alcoholics Anonymous and that there was a, a, a meeting on North Lamar in Austin, Texas. There was a meeting the next night and I could go. She could pick me up. She could meet me there. You don't have to go at all. Well, that was a double dog dare to me because I thought, are you nuts? And I was sincere. I was sincere. I said, alcoholic. And I'm looking at my the, all the pictures of my dad, all the pictures of begging him to come home from the bar. I'm like, I got a job. I've got money in the bank. But she says I got a problem. So I've got to go to this meeting to prove her wrong. Another divine appointment. That I didn't know about. So I go to the meeting, but unfortunately, I take my ego, my arrogance, my self-centeredness, my need to get attention. I take all of that. I got there early. I'm all dressed up. I think I have my briefcase. I hope not, because I wanted to look important. I got there early because, you know, that's what you do for an interview. And I mean, please, that's what I walked in to help Alcoholics Anonymous with me. And in fact, I, I began to do some very important things. I could tell that there were some, uh, in, in, you know, significant things on the wall because they're big and they're hanging, right? The 12 steps and the 12 traditions. Now I've already been to graduate school at this point. So I could think, well, that might be the undergraduate, you know, part of the program. And this could probably be the graduate Part, but there's only 24 things to do and they tell me they have a textbook so I got this no matter what and I started to memorize the first three steps I wish I was making this one up so that if they had a question and answer period at the end of the meeting I could refer to a step that's one of the things I brought to Alcoholics Anonymous another thing I brought to you was when Joe, I mean, Jim, someone, because at that meeting, we've always introduced ourselves with full name and sobriety date. And he said, okay, my name's Jim Stewart, and I've been sober since January 1971. It's 1981. And I went, oh! now you can't take back a gasp. You cannot ungasp. And what happens when you gasp? Everybody looks at you. But my point in my gasp was they'd let this old boy stay for 10 years. And there's only 24 things to do with a textbook. So I felt bad and I thought, well, I can tutor if I don't even need to come back. I can tutor this old boy. I mean, I felt bad. And that is a true story. Now, the part I hate to tell, I don't ever like telling. And it's very emotional for me to tell, but I'll never not tell it. Is this young girl. You know, it was a good AA meeting. There was a, they started on time. They, they um, had a topic. There was a chairperson. The people greeted me at the door. And this young woman begins to share and she starts to cry. And she's trying to share and she starts to cry. And Nancy becomes uncomfortable. And I remember saying in my head, you know, she doesn't have one social skill. She needs to either cry or she needs to talk. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help her. That's what I thought. Well, God gave me this memory when he knew I could hunt, I could take it, when I could take it. And that's that that young woman was a nurse, maybe not a year sober, and she'd come up upon an accident on, I, uh, on Mopac, which is a highway, on a highway, sorry, where she had watched a baby die. 
Now, did I hear that? I hope not. Did I say that? Oh, gosh, I know I didn't. But in my head, all I'm doing for during this time in that meeting is judging and making fun. That's the best I had. That's the best I had. Now, why after that meeting, I'm not alcoholic. I didn't introduce myself as an alcoholic. I thought it would be a lie. But why did I go back the next night? Why did I go back that next Saturday morning? I call it the magic, the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. In that hour, this could be quiet. In that hour, I began to find out I didn't have to be somebody. I could listen to those of you who I knew were somebody, as you told the truth, that you were honest no matter what, no matter what the topic was, you talked about the solution. And I went back and I went back, and I had that turning point on the side of a road when I lied about that I was going out of town, and I drove slightly out of town so that it wouldn't be a lie. I knew it was a turning point. Who would know? I would know. And I couldn't lie. And I walked back into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, I'm an alcoholic. And my life is unmanageable. And I need and want your help. I hooked up with some West Texas uh, AA. And I didn't do it at first. But I finally began to jump in with both feet. I sat all the way down. And again, like I said, I don't have enough time left on this earth to give all that back because it just goes on and on and on, including the honor of being in this meeting. I want to tell you about what what it's like today. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm watching the clock. I want to tell you what it's like today for me because it describes my life today. Uh, These promises, I have some promises that I want to leave here uh, because it does uh, describe my life today. And my sponsor, I was, have to tell you that I called my sponsor and I was working with a couple uh, an AA Al-Anon couple, and I called and I was doing my what favorite whine. You know, somebody had done something wrong, and when somebody did something wrong, I became writer by the second, and I'm going on and on and on. He said, oh, precious. Well, he had my attention then. He, he said, I have some promises for you that I believe that can define your life in AA, in recovery, if you'll stay in the middle, sponsor me, sponsor others. If you'll stay in the meeting, Uh, in the middle these promises come true and I want you to give them away and I believe they define my life today I was promised that if I went to a lot of meetings a lot of meetings you're going to meet people whose insides feel the same way as yours their outside circumstances may never be the same but when you're in a meeting and you're talking honestly from your heart about whatever it is, the truth, and where, what solution you have found because you, you've experienced it. There are going to be people who identify inside like yours. I was promised that if I would um, study the literature, not peruse it, not edit it, I had done that, not decide it wasn't, some pages didn't weren't right, didn't apply to me, studied that literature, every problem you have and every problem you cause, the answers are in that literature. And one of the reasons I believe that today, because I do study literature, I have the honor of having a big book study right now with my sponsees. I have, you know, the reason I believed it then and I believe it today is Uh, One of the reasons is that the literature helped me find a higher power and what to do to get closer to that higher power and enrich and enhance my spiritual condition one day at a time. I believe that. So I do study the literature. I was promised that if I work the steps in order, in order with the sponsor. I don't know if there's any new people on here, but let me just give you a sidebar. Sponsors get real touchy if you work a step and then call them to tell them what you did, okay? They don't seem to like that as much as you working with them on the step. And by the way, from experience, I can tell you that they work better with the guidance of someone who's experienced and worked the 12 steps about calling someone else. Now, I was promised that if I did that, I could become anybody I wanted to be. 
See, I didn't like me when I walked into A. I told you what I brought into AA. I, there were so many things about me, the, uh, the undisciplined, the unprincipled me that I did not like, but did not like. But remember, I don't have any tools. I don't have any um, accountability to change those things. And you're promising me that day that I could become anybody I wanted to be if I surrendered, found a higher power that I choose to call God. Ask that higher power to keep me between the lines. I'm happier there. But keep me there. Ask for God's best because that's the best there is. Get in the room, a private room, and tell the truth about all the resentments, all the fears, all the sexual irresponsibility, all of it. Because there's some good news coming. Have somebody listen to you without judgment. I'd always wanted that. Have a place where you could say, yes, this was my, these were my mistakes. These are the things I wish I'd done differently. Because the good news is that the trash man cometh. I like this story. The fourth step to me is having you over for lunch and there's a lot of trash. Fifth step for me is handing you a trash bag and saying you put your own trash in there. The sixth step for me is taking it to the curb and leaving it there. And the seventh step is the trash man cometh. They pick up my trash on Wednesdays. They've never told me it was too trashy. And God has never said to me, never knocked on my heart. And said that's too trashy. No, not even that, Nancy. I'll take that. And then to be able to take a list uh, and specifically with a sponsor to say, yes, this has to be cleaned up and clean it up. So that you can go 10 and 11 with 10 being me, 11 being God, and 12 being you. All over again, every day, I can become anybody I wanted to be. I was promised that God would always be big enough I don't know about you but there were areas you know we can you know I can be silly finances are you kidding me where does he bank I mean you know uh, romances you know um, where did he go to school I mean you know those kinds of things in my head what if this happens God my higher power would always be present always and be big enough always the best example that i always use because i have a million i have a million of of examples of experiences spiritual awakenings that have proved this statement but here remember those parents that not only did i hate with a passion i hated all the way to indifference it's one of the definitions that I treated horribly. By the way, I didn't talk about that on the bar stool. But I treated horribly. Here's what happened. In May of 1988, my daddy was in the hospital. And we couldn't have known it was the last time. And I remember that I'd already began, uh, began to do some uh, amends with my parents with sponsor direction, writing a note, um, a letter to them and not needing anything. You know, just a, how are you doing? calling and not needing anything uh, i was just thinking about you not the things that weren't true i did just call you to tell you were the best parents ever that wasn't true but i started doing that but my dad's lying in the hospital bed and i walked in and he says they just told me that there's nothing they can do for me and i said i didn't do two things i did not do two things make a joke which is what i would do when i was uncomfortable and I didn't say, Dad, that's not what they said. I didn't, um, you know, I validated what uh, he knew. I said, Dad, I think that's right, and I, and I believe it's going to be okay. And this self-centered person who maybe had left some of that self-centeredness outside the door said, I believe it's going to be okay, and I didn't need to know what okay was. But I didn't know what to do. And I remember leaving the room and getting on that phone with those sponsors and saying, I'm not sure I know what to do. And he said, he gave me this instruction. He said, I want you to go in and I want you to touch him. And I want you to tell him that you love him if you do, if that's the truth. And I found out that I did. And I did touch my dad. And I told him that I loved him. And on Christmas Day at 4 p.m., 
1988, my daddy went home. And I had no unfinished business. That's what work in the steps will do. That's what uh, God's grace and immense presence will do. No unfinished business. And then I had 12 more years with my mama. 12 more years. I didn't, um, I, I have to tell you, I don't know why this is coming up. But when I began to notice that my mother, who was just the rock, you know, um, become um, more fragile. And I made, I made mention to my sponsor. And they said, now, are you, are you um, hugging her? Are you telling her that you love her all the time? And my thought was, well, she's not sick. Now, that's what my humanness will do. That's what my best thought was. And I'm so glad it was. Because on that day, I found out that God is big enough. God changed my heart in a way that there is no way a human power could. Because there was not a time. There was not a time that when I saw my mother, I didn't put my arms around her. She didn't hug much. We had not touched one another. But I'll never forget the time we hugged and she didn't let go. I'll never forget. It. I'll never forget looking in her eyes and telling her that I love her, which is about to happen. And then she was got sick and was in the hospital, couldn't have known it was the last time. And on that particular day, she knew I had a commitment like today. Okay. And I was, I was going to get, I need to go to the airport. And uh, she kept saying, you've got to go. you got to go. And it was true. I said, Mama, I don't want to go today. She said, I know. But you have a commitment. She knew what you had taught me about commitment. So I said, I know i got to go. And I had this flashback of one of the whines that I said in early sobriety. See, I, I don't know that I should ever make a mention of them. I don't even know if they ever held me as a baby. Did they rock me? Well, my friends, I, I kind of looked up and my mother had her head on my shoulder. I had my arm around her and I was rocking her. And she kept saying, you got to go. And I said, Mommy, you want to get in a chair? Do you want to get in a chair? She said, yeah, I want to get in a chair. And I got her in that chair and I knelt in front of her. See, my favorite definition of humility that I got from the seventh step is the ability to stand up, but the willingness to kneel down. And I looked in her eyes and I said, Mama, have I told you today how happy I am that you're my mother, that you are my mother? She said, yeah. And I had to leave. And I get on an airplane, and when I get off, literally my phone is ringing. My phone was ringing, and it was the doctor. He said, uh, the, after you left, we had to put your mother on a ventilator, and I don't believe that she's going to make it through the night. And I said, doctor, will you put the phone up to her ear? Because I believe she could hear me. And I said one more time, do you remember how much I love you? I, I am that you have been my mama. And I think she said, yeah. And then I said, mama, if it's your time to go home tonight, I'm going to be okay. And you know what? She knew what okay meant. She had been in my home where I might as well say you. People in Alcoholics Anonymous were there. She didn't let them. She knew that if I stayed in the middle, I was going to be okay. And even though I don't have children, I believe that's what a mother would want to know, that we're going to be okay. And she knew that because God's big enough, no matter what. And the last promise I want to give you is, Nancy, give away a little bit. If you give away a little bit, say yes. You know, I always used to think in real grandiose things. Maybe I'm going to have to invent something. That, oh, Lord, I'll just say that cures cancer. I always thought I had to do something really bit big. And what I'm being told, because what you ask of me is not too much. Give away a little bit. Yeah, chair those meetings. Be an inner group rep. 
be a GS owner. Get there early and set up the chairs or make the call. They never wanted me to make the call. But do those things when you're asked to say yes. Because if you do, you're going to get back tenfold. And, you know, I'm looking at this screen, and I've been in so many places where I see the spirit in your eyes. I see the God with skin on them because I need it today as much or more as I ever have in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to be in the no matter what club, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what is going on around me, I want to be accountable. I want to be the person that God wants me to be so that I can do the things that God wants me to do. And so I hope I give away a little bit. And Glenn, I cannot thank you enough for this privilege. And I do apologize for having the time long in my head. <laughs>